Welcome to Los Angeles Data Platform User Group. This session will be recorded and shared on our YouTube and Rumble channels. Good day, you know, actually good time of the day, everyone, whenever you are. By the way, please drop your city and country into the chat so we know which communities we're serving. Welcome to Los Angeles Data Platform User Group. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Steve and I'll be moderator of this virtual meeting. I'll be joined by Yelena. Um, if you new to our user group or um, trying to keep uh, up to date on our meetings, you can check it on Eventbrite. We also have Meetup. You can also send us an email directly as well. All those three, all, all those three hyperlinks are clickable. Um, again, if you try to follow us on all the social media, all the social media links are there. Um, at least all the main ones. Uh, this way you can keep up to date on uh, upcoming meetings, any videos that we uh, make that be making public, any reminders of upcoming meetings as well. And we also have uh, weekly newsletters with uh, um, resources that we find useful uh, that you can review. You can also join our mailing list. Uh, and again, this is just one of the other ways of uh, notifying you on uh, what's going to happen next week, actually next month, and also uh, this uh, weekly uh, links as well. And this event is sponsored by Microsoft Team 3 and Data Driven Technologies. I think everybody knows Microsoft. Team 3 is a company that provides uh, virtualized storage. And uh, data driven technologies, or as we uh, call it, DDT, is uh, the nonprofit that funds this user group as well as SQL Server in LA, or as we call it now, Data SQL Server in LA. And it's also going to be funding SQL Server in Silicon Valley that's going to be on uh, that upcoming Saturday in San Jose. So if you have nothing better to do, or if you actually want to have more knowledge into SQL or data, you can join SQL Salary, and I'm going to drop the uh, link here now. It's when is that going to be? It's going to be October 21st. It's this oh, Saturday. Wow. SQL Salary um, SV. And of course, this is uh, not remote. This is in person. Uh, during the presentation, please feel free to drop your questions to the chat, uh, and I'll voice them out for John. And without further ado, let's move to the rock speak, rock star of today's online meeting. Uh, John, please take it away and introduce yourself. Sure. Good evening. My name is John Miner. I work for a company called Insight uh, Digital Innovations. <clears throat> They're out of Arizona, and I'm a data architect. So basically, um, I design software for a living, okay? More specifically, uh, data platforms and reporting. So I am gonna take over sharing, and I'm gonna bring up Chrome and talk a little about myself. Um, I've um, been awarded the MVP from Microsoft for eight years. I love being part of the program because it keeps me uh, current with what's be being changed at Microsoft, and there is always a lot of change. OK, if you're curious about my, uh, you know, uh, submissions, you can go down and you can look at, you know, what events I'm doing, right? and you can go through here. Uh, I'm going to close this one and we're going to talk about my GitHub page. My GitHub page is John Minor 3 Community Work. And when this is done, I will be dropping uh, a new uh, presentation here. And it's called What's New in Azure Databricks, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, if you like what I talk about, and I write about a lot of things, especially Apache Spark, you can see a bunch of articles here as well as Databricks. Um, please go to MS SQL Tips. Uh, Jeremy, I've been writing for him for almost 10 years, so uh, almost 125 articles. So I'm going to close that. And we're going to do um, let me go to the desktop and then show you 
close out of here. So this is the desktop right here, and we're going to talk about Azure DataBricks. And usually part of Azure DataBricks, you're going to have a bunch of things like DataBricks. You're going to have a storage account. You're going to have a key vault, which is backed by secrets in Azure DataBricks. And you're also going to maybe use Loggy Analytics to keep track of things, OK? Um, so let's bring up the slide deck, and we'll start talking about tonight's topic. It's going to minimize this. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my camera so we can get more of the screen, and I will, at the very end, turn it back on. So with that said, let's minimize this. Go away. I don't know. It's not going away. Maybe it's Windows 11. I've got a new operating system, so there we go. And let me make sure I'm in presentation mode. So I am in presentation mode. Great. So I'm going to be talking about what's new in Azure DataBricks. Okay. And if you want to reach me, you can send me a note, john.miner at insight.com. I'm also on LinkedIn. And once in a while, I tweet on Twitter. Like tonight, I was tweeting about talking at the LA Data Platform User Group. So purpose. As a data engineer, it's very hard to keep up with the technology changes, like I said, right? And top tier companies okay are enhancing their offerings to keep pace with their competitors okay so let me tell you a little about databricks it was first released on aws in 2015 and it was later released in azure in 2017 and recently re released on google cloud platform in 2021 um, the main game changer that happened to the product was the Delta format, which was re released in 2019. And basically, the Delta format, what does it do? It gives you transactional integrity, OK? And what they did is they slapped on log files onto Parquet and basically created a table format that looks like a relational table, OK? And this is for cloud workloads, OK, for working with a data lake. So today, we're going to talk about What's relatively new in Databricks? Some of these things might have happened last two, three years. Um, you know, I've been using Databricks for probably about four years now, constantly. And, um, you know, unless you're paying attention, you might miss like some of the things that have changed. So let's talk about topics. We're going to talk about core topics. How do you do data engineering with Spark? Okay? So we have to start off with some basis. And then we're going to talk about what we used to do for workflow, okay, before they created the workflow uh, section. It used to be just a job and you called just one notebook. Now it has precedent constraints. It has, um, you know, alerting. It tells you, hey, by the way, did it fail? Did it succeed? You could also say, hey, alert on duration. It ran too long, okay? So you can do that. Um, all that was spark.read, spark.write. Those are the main things we're going to talk about. Autoloader was something that came out recently. And autoloader is great because now we can go ahead and we can just drop files into a directory. And autoloader can be, you know, executing either a batch, say run it once, or you can run it all the time. And then delta live tables. What is delta live tables? That is something that you can schedule too, but it's with streaming. So both autoloader and streaming, uh, delta live tables are using streaming. Um, really cool with delta live tables because you can do materialized views. There's some restrictions like pivot tables don't work. And last but not least, uh, we're not going to talk about Star Wars, but we're going to talk about clones or so cloning. Okay, so um, the difference between a deep and shallow clone. Okay, so what is Spark? Spark is a unified processing engine that can analyze big data, basically. And we can see this picture was taken from Databricks, and it has four components that you can actually use with the product, right? And again, they keep on changing, but I'm talking about just the data engineering component. There's also a SQL data warehouse component, which I do a talk on. And there's also on top of that, a machine learning component, okay, like MLflow. We're not going to talk about that so much, but we're just going to talk about, today we're going to talk about the SQL part, which is the data engineering, which is data frames and SQL. Um, it also has the ability to solve graphing problems like the traveling salesperson. I'm going from uh, Rhode Island, that's where I live, in Providence, not too far from it, and say I'm going to Los Angeles in California. Maybe I have a friend in Chicago. Maybe I have a friend in Philadelphia and say Texas, right? How do we go 
to get there and back the shortest distance so we could figure out a roadmap and that would be a graph problem okay machine learning and again i said that uh spark has machine learning we're not going to talk about it in depth but just quickly what does machine learning do everyone's talking about natural language processing nowadays and chat gbt right but um traditionally machine learning solves like five different problems like hey is the anomaly so this the dog doesn't look like the cat right we are maybe taking pictures we only have dogs in our kennel. There's something wrong, right? Um, you know, predict a price, right? So that's like, you know, linear uh, regression. That was a typical problem. We can do clustering, right? There's a bunch of algorithms like that. Um, so and last but not least, streaming. It's the Internet of Things, right? So uh, the, my favorite example is um, when you watch TV and you see the Maytag guy and he's inside your refrigerator, right? And you open up the door. Well, stream could be like, hey, is a camera inside your refrigerator? Who's doing it? Or maybe you're doing real-time frames outside a office, right? That would be streaming the data to the Internet, okay? So let's talk about data processing with Spark, okay? Spark is like many of the modern data distributed systems and snowflake's kind of the same it uses jvm stray or virtual machine stray and we can see that it's made of one or more virtual machines uh, if you have a single node you have both the driver and executor on the same machine they're both running jvms and what it does is it takes a program that you write and it divides it into tasks and i'll show you during one of our examples hey yes it runs a task and that task will run on the driver and it uses some memory okay and the most important thing to think about when doing this is for each of the cores you have you have a task right so one-to-one -one correlation and it's good for parallelism and how you partition the data so if you have big data you try to make the number of tasks or slots match the partitions right so in this example if we had a huge amount of data and we wanted all the executors to work at the same time then we would want to partition in a count of eight because we can see there's eight slots okay so let's talk about quality zones right well when you use a data lake you gonna want to move data from bronze silver and gold okay what does that mean well they're just qualities for like if you're in olympics right if you're in last place you're bronze right silver is second place and gold is the same thing it's also in terms of like how you're refining the data so usually bronze is weird of raw data drops okay so and we can see this is also depicting this is again a picture from databricks but on the left hand side we see streaming and batch this is a lambda architecture also so you have a fast lane which is streaming data sets delta a live tables and you have batch you just run a job on a schedule right and you can see this little thing that looks like a wave okay that's the delta okay and when you go from roar you might go to refined and usually when i do this talk i talk about the customer table say we get an address for a customer it came in the bronze layer roar and it was wrong so maybe we have paid for a subscription and we do a rest api out give it the address to come back where it cleaned up address right maybe um there was something with uh, zip code right so silver would have the refined data okay now say we have the VentureWorks, and we're going to talk about VentureWorks tonight because that's a data set i used okay and say we wanted to have the gold and put together the data so it's for reporting so maybe we would have unaggregated data which joins and then we have aggregated data for ai and reporting right so that'd be our goal later okay so that's a brief description of zones and quality uh the only point i want to suggest after experience is make sure you have good naming conventions also um with tables you know delta tables if you're using them you can put descriptions in and that's a minimum uh lodger is maybe you want to think about using a data catalog in a glossary to keep track of things because uh the more data you get the more harder it is to find the stuff and having um you know this support system for you know the data glossary and data catalog it helps the users find where the data is okay so i always like to talk about file types okay and there's a couple different file types there's weak file types and strong file types right 
And, you know, it's not like the guy who's at, you know, the gym that can lift weights versus not lifting weights. A weak format is something that's going to probably cause you problems and in the middle of the night, right? Like a CSV file. Say I wasn't expecting uh, the delimiter character as part of the day it's coming in. Guess what? Now it suddenly thinks it has an extra field. And it depends on the package you're using. Sometimes it might just break. Maybe it left justifies the fields over one because now you have another delimiter and you lose data. So that's a weak format, right? It can be easily broken. It has a lot of features that you... Um, will not have a strong format like the Apache Parquet, okay? Apache Parquet is binary, so you can't hack it really well, right? In a CSV file, you just download it, put it in an editor, and suddenly you see the data, right? Also, I don't know what the column names are in a CSV file. I have to scan the file to infer the data types. And many times, you have to read the whole file in, right? Also, um, compression, right? CSV, yeah, you can put a gzip on it, it's supported, but it's not internal compression. It's not like a column store, which Apache Parquet is, okay? So again, um, there's two types of file formats. Uh, we're gonna use weak ones tonight, but uh, I usually use strong ones in my data set. I'm just gonna use weak ones because they're good to show the data. Load patterns, right? So, <laughs> You know, going to the cloud takes some inertia, right? You have data on premise, you're moving it to the cloud unless you're totally cloud born, right? And so if you have four terabytes of data on premise and you want to do full load every day, that means you have to stuff over that pipe, even if you compress it, say 50%, two terabytes of data. It's a lot of data to move, right? So full load pattern is really good for small data size, right? Incremental load pattern still involves a full load. So if you have that four terabyte and you want in the cloud, at one point you have to move it. But going forward, you know, what you do is usually get an incremental, a delta, right? Not a delta table, but a delta file, okay? Not the format of the file, but a delta like meaning a small chunk, okay? So give me today's data. Okay, and with that, you could do an upsert pattern. Uh, if your system's really smart, you could actually do the delta file um, with, you know, is it an insert, is it an update, is it a delete, and then you can determine whether or not you're going to do mock deletes, okay, in your data sets, okay. Uh, again, with larger data sets, um, partitioning is really great because now if you do a search and you say, hey, partition by year and month, and I only always report by month, guess what? Now you can pinpoint out of terabytes of data just the files that you need. So like I said, the most important thing that happened to basically Spock in general, and this includes Synapse and you know Fabric now, right? Because they all use you know Spark Engine as well as Delta um, and Databricks, is the Delta file format. Before this, you know, you didn't have acid, and you don't have to worry about acid so much in a data lake because we it's not an OLTP. You're not having thousands and thousands of transactions, but you still want to have your loads not bump into each other. You also want to have enforcement of the schema. Time travel is great because now it can tell you, hey, what did I load yesterday versus today? And it's some isolation for multiple readers and writers, and it's open source. Okay, so. Let's talk about data engineering in its simplest form, right? And this is a quote from Wikipedia. Data engineering refers to building the systems that enable the collection and usage of data. So there's really three things you really need to know. Spark.read, that reads the data into a data frame. Spark, the PySpark library, and it can use either data frames or SQL to join data and transform it. And then you want to write it back out, right? Spark.write. Okay. So we're about to go into our first example, okay? And we're gonna talk about before workloads. What did we have to do? Say I wanted to load the AdventureWorks database. How do we do it, right? Well, we create a parent notebook and we create a child notebook, right? And the child notebook would be our worker. The parent work notebook would pass the information to tell the child how to do the work, okay? And we'd schedule it to execute. It's a very simple design pattern, okay? The problem is it's very hard to enforce constraints between a notebook call. So say, hey, I want, you know, the first notebook which maybe loads customers to finish before I load in. I also want accounts to load before I load sales, okay? So we have two loads that we need, and the third one's 
the dependent load, okay? How do we do that? Well, it was very hard to do. We would have to call each one and hard code. It wasn't something that was easy, okay? Second thing is how do you learn on failure? Well, yes, you can go ahead and send an email out, but there wasn't really anything built into the product to do it, okay? So we're gonna do the first example and we're gonna talk about before workflows. Now, one of the things you do with cluster, and hopefully my cluster did not shut down. Is it there? Let's see. Okay, workspace. Shared. What's new talk? Okay, workflow. So let's go into, take a look at the cleanup. Hopefully, okay, it's still running. Awesome. So if we look, we have a data lake here, right? It's Avengerworks V2, it's a bronze, right? We hit this, we can see it's going to, what is dbutils.fs.ls? dbutils is just like msutils for Spark, for Microsoft Synapse or, you know, Fabric. And basically what it does is it has a bunch of uh, utility functions. FMS means file system, LS means list. So we can see that these two directories is a, in the bronze, there's a dim directory and a fact directory, okay? Now we can see underneath the dim directory, we can see that there could be a count directory, right? And then underneath the count directory, there could be a file, right? So we see the file there, right? And so same thing with the fact, is the fact, and there's a silver directory. And again, I'm going really fast. I'm not gonna run each one of these, but I'm just showing you the directory structure. And if we look on the silver dims, we see them all, right? That is how it's mounted, okay? And here, that's a mount point, it's one way to do it. You can also look at the storage, right? Remember we talked about it's um, Databricks is talking to the data lake. <clears throat> so we can go here. It was Venture, VentureWorks <clears throat> V2, um, bronze, right? Dim, and now we can see all the directories. We can go count, we can see there's our CSV file, okay? So back to the demo, we have all these. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna rebuild, okay, in this demo, the dim, okay, which is a database, right? So syspark.sql drop database if exist. And it's gone. So I just deleted. Now, these are you know remote files. I'm not actually they're unmanaged tables, so I'm not actually deleting the table or information. I'm just deleting it. And I say, okay, delete the database here, put it in, and then I'm gonna do this. And so that one said create the database. This one did this. We're gonna look for facts now. It's gone. And now we're going to create the database of facts. Okay, and then if we say, hey, show me the product straight, this is going to fail because it shouldn't be there. Okay, we can double check that by going to the catalog too. This is the, the catalog. Okay, and we can see dim has no tables, fact has no tables. Okay, if we go back to recent and we're looking at, uh, this was clean up, I want to go to a workspace though. Okay, so remember we said a parent-child relationship. The parent is going to be the run ETL process. Okay, we're going to schedule that. The child is going to be the load delta table. Now, when we write programs, okay, in Spark, we want to write a program that's useful and reusable, right? Okay, that's the basis of anything that you do in software design. And one of the things you're going to learn right away is something called widgets. Widgets allow us to pass information, right? So we can pass the path the data lake f path versus the file path. And we can say, hey, turn debugging on that. We can say, because the CSV file, we want to not infer the schema because it will take us more time to do that. We just want to tell it, hey, these count key is an int, okay? We also talked about how partitioning, you know, affects it, so we're going to pass the partition. This is the algorithm. Basically, it creates the source part, uh, path file, the destination, reads a park A file source, removes the existing delta directory if it's there, writes out the directory, and then it creates the hive table, okay? So we can go through each one of these. This is basically defining the widgets if they're not there. This one will read it up and it creates the path, and if we have the bugging on it, it's gonna say, hey, print out the path. This is the product, strike right? because we're loading product. And then we can go and this one makes up the path for the silver. That's where we're gonna put the silver, and it's gonna be a delta format, okay? 
And then we can say, hey, read it up. So spark.read, just like I said, and it's options. If we have no schema, then we're going to infer the schema true. Otherwise, we're going to use the schema. Okay. And we can see this is actually shown the information. And again, I'm going fast. This is kind of like just an overview, show you these techniques. All this code's going to be out there. You can go ahead and play with it. The main thing is once we're done, we're going to say, hey, guess what? Try. We're going to remove the directory if it's there. Then we're going to write out the delta format, overwrite it, okay? And then we're going to say drop the table if it exists. We're going to create a new table. Okay, and that's it. So if we run this run all, this is going to run through all these steps. And at the end, we should have um, dim.product, right? And we can see this took one second. And if not, using delta, so it should be done, right? And this is 1025 my time. So if we go catalog, we go to dim, we got product, we can see product works, details, unknown, it's external, which I said it's unmanaged, and guess what, we can see a snapshot of data. So it worked the way we wanted, okay? Nothing to write home about, this is the typical way we've been doing data engineering for Spark for at least five years, right? So let's go back to here and look at the run process. John? So how do, yep? There's a question, would you be able to share the notebook links? Yes, I'm going to, uh, at the very beginning, I said that I'm going to put it out here, John Minor 3 and okay. GitHub. And Perfect. so I will have this out there by tomorrow morning, okay? Okay, And awesome. it Thank will you. be at the bottom. It'll say what's new in uh, Databricks, okay? Awesome. Thank you. No problem. So you can go through and you can use all this code. I'm just giving it out to everyone. So the interesting thing is this, is that we saw those widgets. How do we call a notebook with those parameters on widgets? Well, we have to create a dictionary, right? So we say data lake is this path for bronze and it's my account table. Here's, I don't want to show debugging because I know it works. I want to petition it for two and here's my schema. Run it, right? And then we run the second one. So we could run this whole thing, okay? Um, right now we can also schedule it. So let's talk about scheduling workflows and it's basic, right, before workflows, okay? We would just run a single task, okay? So we would say task parent notebook, right? And what we would say is, okay, it's a notebook, okay? We can stop a new job cluster or we could edit this. We could say, hey, guess what? I want to use the current cluster. So, because I'm talking right now, I'm going to use the current cluster so I don't have to wait three or five minutes for it to start up. Okay, so it's gonna grab the current. We can also say add libraries. We could also pass it parameters, but we don't need parameters because inside this notebook, again, if we go back to the what's new, it's already calling each one already with the dbutils.run. Okay, when we talked about the utilities and one of the things is you can say notebook and run this notebook now. This is the path to the notebook, which is the current directory, load delta file, 60 params, the full load, okay? So let's kick this guy off and then we'll go back to the slide deck. So we go back to runs and what we do is just to run it, you go up to here, you can hit run now. So there's some really cool things I wanna to talk to you about before I hit the run. We can actually take these workflows and not only like code, we can check the workflows and we're gonna talk about how workflow is just a JSON file and how to modify it. Also for the schedule, we can add a schedule here. For the schedule, we can say run every day at this time, right, and so on. There's some really cool things about job notifications. We can set up a duration thread host to say, hey, this job, we can see, shouldn't take more than 15 minutes. If it takes more than 15 minutes, please notify me, try it. We can do that by coming over here and put my name in. I want John Miner to be notified. And let's do the one with the duration, try it. We're gonna say, set the duration, okay? And warning, and then timeout. So we're gonna say, if it takes more than 10 minutes, I want a warning. And if it takes more than 20 minutes, I want the timeout, okay? So now these are new features in, you know, Databricks, which are really awesome. So now we have that, and now I'm gonna go back to the edit notifications, and I'm gonna make sure, ooh, I already got notified, right? So awesome. So we're gonna run this, okay, and we're gonna view the run. And the cool thing about the run is, guess what? When you view it, you can come down and it's gonna show you, oh, by the way, it's starting this, right? And then we can see, oh, it's running this, but because you do the DPU runs, it's actually submitting another job, right? So we go to the other job 
and we can see, guess what? It's running through. It took nine seconds, and we can hopefully catch it. So now it did this. Okay, it's done. So we didn't catch it. So we go back to runs. And if we go here, okay, that's an old one. And jobs, this guy right here. And then run straight. We can see it's running right now. And then we see this one took 20 seconds, so maybe we can catch one. This one's running right now, so this might be really hard, but hopefully I can catch it. And we can see right here, whoops, it's not creating the hive table, see? So we caught a catch on the hive table. So it just finished the hive table, and which one is it? It's for the geography, customer key, integer geography key. So maybe customer, I'm just guessing. Let's go up to the path. So anyways, that's how you set up old school. Let's talk about new school, okay? So that's before workflows and after workflows. So after workflows, we can create a child notebook, but then we create the job. We don't need that power anymore. And we create tasks to call the child book and we schedule it execute so this is a simple design also but the cool thing now is we can force constraints remember i said we can say hey count has to be loaded before uh customer and account and customer have to be loaded say before internet sales we can do that and again we can add the alerting which i just showed you okay so if we go here i'm not going to run the second one because i'm running the first one to load the tables and i'll show you when that's done but if we go to workflows and we go to after workflows. I have two examples. I have a small one and a big one. I'll show you the bigger one and the reason why I did it this way. So on this one, whoops, I always hit the wrong button. There we go. I want to go with task. We can see now we can do the same we did on the first one, but now we have to do a few more things. So all that data that I was passing along, now I have to put the data in as parameters, okay? And it's kind of difficult, right? It's kind of tedious because we can say, okay, say I want to add a new notebook, okay, and I want to change this, right? Then I would go ahead and say uh, task, right, and then LA, right, user group, okay? And then I'm going to go to the full load, right? So I'll find the full load, so it's the full load, hit confirm, okay? And that's fine, right? But the problem now is, see, it doesn't, understand the parameters. We have to add each one by hand. It's kind of difficult. So you had to do 100 of these. This could be quite time consuming, okay? We're gonna talk about a way to do that without actually, once we get one or two of them, we can repeat it, okay? And then we can use the CLI, which is the command line run time to do it, okay? So let's go back to job number three and I wanna show you something really complicated and I'll show you how you did it. Let's look at a task. Hey, wow, look at that. Look at all those tasks. So if we, uh, maybe I went too far in, how about center it and then zoom in, plus, 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 plus. Okay, so we have the Adventureworks count in currency being loaded before customer. That's before the re, uh, reseller. And again, this is arbitrary, I just did it. The main thing is all the dimensions have to be loaded before the facts, and there's only two facts, this call center here and the sales, right? But I just came up with something that looked pretty. How did I come up with that, okay? Well, let's go to the desktop where I have this presentation, and let's take a look at the JSON, because this is all JSON, that's all it is. So we looked at job number two, I'm gonna show you the real easy one, and then we'll open up the harder one. Okay, so we have email alerts, no notifications, okay? But see this task, this is the very first thing. So this task says, load Eventworks task. We can see the path, guess what the base parameter is. So now, instead of having to do it through the GUI, I can just copy this from here all the way down to here and copy it, okay? Actually, a little farther, all the way down to here. This is the very first one. So it's your notifications and this, and you can see this is the second one, concurrency. And then the third one's gonna be to a lift because it, before you define it, it has the depends on. And what it does it does is cascade. So modifying this is not really that hard to do, as you can see, okay? Right? So say we um, did something very simple to modify. Let's uh, open it again. Okay, and 
let's do something stupid like on the count, we want to call this count key one, okay? And we know that's not what I want, but we're just going to do it to show you that I can do it programmatically, okay? How do you do this programmatically? Because getting something this complicated, yeah, it takes a lot of work, but it's a lot easier to do in TextPad if you have 100 different objects you want to do versus if you're trying to do, do it through the GUI, right? And if we look at the tasks here and we go to that count, we can see when we go down here, there is a count key, not count key one. So how do we overwrite this, okay? Well, the very first thing is we need to get a token, okay? And I'm gonna delete this token, so I'm gonna tell you that up front, so don't try to grab it, because it does give you access to it. So I'm gonna revoke the token, I'm gonna generate a new one, I'm gonna call it LA user group. And then I'm gonna generate the token, okay? And so at this point, copy that, otherwise it's gonna go away. And then if I go back to this window here, oops, too many windows, stop, stop, stop. I just wanna grab the open one. Maybe it's not there then, desktop. Community, current talks, what's new? And this is my CLI, okay? So what I did is I deleted it, I'm gonna put this guy right here, so control V. Okay, so I'm gonna save it. Okay, how do we do this, right? First is we wanna get into a command shell which is right here. All languages, um, cloud systems have it. There's a command shell for Google. This happens to be the Azure one, okay? It's really a Linux box with a PowerShell wrapper. You need to do pip install Databricks and it brings down the Databricks library because, you know, obviously, like I said, it's a Linux box with this Python on it. And then we're just gonna run it. So if we do is we, the command to do it, and again, it's all gonna be given to you, is just basically configure token, okay? So at this point, we're gonna do configure token. And for some reason, control paste doesn't work here, so we're gonna do this. Now the token asks for two things. It asks, where is your data rex? Now the easiest way you can do it is you can see it right here, ADB all the way up to the net. Uh, it's also on the very first page of the properties. So it's this guy right here. So I'm gonna go back to one of these, if I can find it, it's this guy, and then paste it in. Okay, so that's easy. The hard part now is the token. It's not gonna show it. So just, again, make sure you get it all the way without white space, see? Right click and then copy, right click and then paste and hit enter. If it's working after you did, you know, databricks.pips, right? After you installed it, you can do databricks. Okay, and then what you can do is um, secret list and then say something scope and it's going to say remember I told you secrets are being stored um maybe I got the secret dash a maybe it's scopes but I always forget the syntax okay and data x dash h okay secrets when asked I thought it was maybe that's probably why I didn't know s list scopes here we go Command line. Okay, so we can see we have an Azure backed secret scope that has a key vault. Okay, so awesome. So, how do we upload this? Okay, so the very first thing is we wanted to say upload it and then we just want to create a job. Okay, so let's see if the very first job that I had cooking in the background is done, right? So, if we go to jobs, and we go here, and guess what? Yahoo ran, and it didn't take much time because we didn't have to stop the cluster. See this one, 11 minutes? And so I didn't get any warnings, unfortunately. I should have made it do that. And we can also see that, did it really work? Is the fact available, right? We can go call center and then do some sample data. And yes, it loaded everything. So that's awesome, right? So next thing we're gonna do is we wanted to change the job. That's what we're working on, job number two, right? And if I try to, you know, put it out here when it's existing, it's gonna complain. So I'm gonna show you that the task are here and it's gonna load basically account, currency, and customer, okay? So we wanna delete this one and replace it, right? So we're gonna hit delete job, delete, boom. Okay, it's gone. Go back to our window. There's always an upload button here, right? Upload and download, so we're gonna upload. I'm gonna upload my new definition, right? Because it's just a JSON file. And then we're just gonna load it with the CLI and create a job out of it. So this is number two. So now job number two is loaded. And now what we want to do is we want to change this to job number two. 
control C and then paste it and hit there. And it said, hey, guess what? It's a new job. So let's go take a look. So we go to jobs. Oops, there's a new job. Let's run it because and we'll double check to see the task, right? And of course, it's hopefully nothing's more dependent on it. But see, remember count key one? Well, it's count key one's here now. It's going to run now. So now this one, shared job cluster. Ooh, let's do this. That's all. Uh, let's go back. I'm going to do one quick edit because I want to get this done really quick. Um, if you remember, I told you that I wanted to, mm, is there any way to really do this? Yeah, we can do it really quick. We'll do this. We'll do a couple changes. Uh, cancel, save task. My other cluster is ready up. If I start another cluster, it will take another five minutes. I don't want to wait five minutes. So I'm going to just, just take two minutes to do, and then if that, two seconds maybe. And now we have everything going to my shared cluster. Now run, run and view run. It should stop right now. So see, these two are running at the same time. Awesome. Okay. So what did we learn? We learned that, you know, using jobs, we can do precedent constraints. We can do a lot of cool things like alert on failure, alert on completion, alert on duration. Okay. So we're going to go back to the slide deck and we're going to talk about what could be a task because I kind of like skimmed over it already, but there's other things you can make a task. Okay. So click this guy. Next guy down. Okay. So what can be a cast? It can be a lot of different things. We can have code. We talked about that, right? And it's usually a notebook, but you can also do a Python script, a Python wheel, a jar and a Spock submit. So there's a bunch of stuff you can do. And also the mixing and matching now with what you can do with say the SQL, right? So you can do in the SQL warehouse, a dashboard, a query, alert, a SQL file. Also, um, you can do a Delta Live pipeline. So I'm gonna show you that. And you can also do a DBT. And DBT is a Python script for managing schemas. And they're a close partner with Databricks. And last but not least, you can do a control flow, uh, flow. So you can have one job called multiple jobs. So if you have something really complex, you can keep on building it up. Okay. Let's talk about autoloader. Okay. Because autoload, what does it do? It's a lightweight for light traffic. Okay, and there's two ways to do it. You have it basically determines, hey, I got something new coming in. Find the files. Either I look by file list and see, hey, I haven't done a checkpoint on this. I found it new. Or if you have a huge thing, you can set up this notification service, which basically sets up a background service, so it's a lot more involved. Um, file list is good enough. That's what we're going to do today. It also works on internally on something called RocksDB. I just want to tell you this, but you don't need to worry about it. It's just a key value for store. It keeps track of the incoming files and then checks points the files like, hey, I didn't finish loading this. It failed. Let's reload it, right? And streaming it uses similar syntax of streaming. It's more scalable and reliable, okay? So this is the first step before Delta Live tables came out, okay? So let's talk about autoloader. External process drops files into the raw zone of the data lake. Autoload can append the data to the bronze delta type uh, files. It can overwrite the silver ones at the latest record. Increment the loads. Could merge newest ones with the silver too. Okay. What is it? easy to set up? Must code for each quality zone. Okay. Cons. Uh, you know, can use parameterized notebooks. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to create some JSON files and we're going to autoload some data. So before I was doing Spark.read, now we're going to do something that guess what? Streaming actually does the loading for us. So that's like the next evolution of working with files. And we can see that this is complete now, right? It took uh, 11 seconds, 11 seconds, and 14 seconds, so really quick. We look at the catalog, and if we go dim and we go to account, right, we have count one key. Okay, so guess what? I did make the change, okay? So we're going to work with this directory called autoload, right here, autoload. Okay, and I don't know how that table got there, but it did. I will definitely drop that one. Uh, anyone have a question? Uh, nope. Okay, so we're going to go to the 
third example. So we're going to go to workflows, right? Back to our main directory. So workspace, shared, what's new, and we're going to talk about the auto load, okay? Um, so now we have these things as Delta. Let me make sure it doesn't do this. Uh, so I'll make sure I don't break anything. Dim account. Okay. No, I'm going to do, I'm going to rerun that one job and then run this again. So we're going to go after this one and task. And what I'm going to do is, where is this? I want to change this to there and then save task and then just run that and then we'll do the next task. Um, probably not a good example because the next one, it actually takes the Delta files and dumps them to JSON files just to work with a different format. And again, we sort of didn't take long, so it only took a minute to do this. So just make sure this is done before we go into the next example. Took 13 seconds, interesting. Okay, it's all done. So we go back to the workspace where I was and we'll go to auto loading. Okay, and it's a little different. The syntax is definitely different, right? It's going to auto loader. Okay, so copy to JSON directory. Okay, so. Uh, this is path, copy one, read variables. Just bear with me one second. Okay, so do time. Okay, so which one do I run next? I apologize, I've only done this a couple times. So, what a load, Jason. So, this is the one that says the date to data lake path, right? and it deletes the target so okay so what it's going to do is it's going to create variables remove target directory start stream job add columns stop stream job recreate hive database recreate if needed and then recreate hive table okay so this is going to do everything okay um for auto if i remember right so let's go into the details we can see that the very beginning we're pulling all this information and we're going to say hey this is where our notebook is, V3. Petition counts two, dim, account true, right? Then it's gonna look for VentureWorks raw dim account for a file in V3. And then what's gonna do is it's gonna copy that over to the bronze, okay? And then we can see that um, da, 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 it gets a count. And that's the starting count. And we can keep track of these counts, like the starting if we're doing a pending and adding, and we can see what the delta is going in if we wanted to. And now this is the new syntax right here. So we're going to read stream, but the auto loads cloud file. So it's file based, right? We're going to look for JSON. We're going to infer the column types, but you know, it's JSON, so we know what it is, where the location is, schema evolution, load it. Okay, so we're going to load it. Then we're going to add file name processing. Right, so we're going to say select now. And what this does is we're going to add the source file and the processing time as stamps to the table. We can re partition to what we want, that's optional. Right, then what we're going to do is we're going to write. So this should be again, so I've only done this twice, so that's off. So we're going to write it and we're going to say merge a schema, use a checkpoint, we're going to append, trigger it. Okay, done. And then we wait until it terminates. We're going to create the database of it as this. We're going to update the file and then grab the file count and so on. So let's clean this up to actually get this to run. So I am going to do manual run. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically do the Python notebooks. I'm going to do a percent SQL. I'm just going to do a drop database, right? Auto cascade, right? So we're going to get rid of the auto database. And it's gone. And what we're also going to do is, for giggles, 
I'm going to close out of this one. We're going to go up. It was V3, right? So if we go to V3, it's looking in raw for our files, right? This is our, we can see over here, this should be a JSON file. If I can find the extension to it, come on, right there, it's a JSON file. So we have the raw files. What I'm going to do is I'm going to delete um, the bronze because we're actually, and I just want to make sure this is V3, clones, raw, zones. Did not understand why zones are there, but whatever. Um, always something. So I'm going to get rid of these two guys, right? Because that's where we're loading it to. Okay, and then um, I guess there's no silver. Let me double check it again. Uh, which one does the manual run? Let's go back to the auto loader. So, do, 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 so, it reads it, and yeah, the path is it's auto, and then it's just going to bronze. That's all. There's no silver in this example, okay? So, how do we schedule this? We go to workflows, and what we want to do is copy. This is the copy if we wanted to delta to JSON directories, and this is the auto load. And we can take a look at the cast. And if we zoom in, okay, and take a look. Okay, so it's pass running an auto loader. And what it's going to do is count to uh, once schema is going to be dim and it's going to put it into AdventureWorks 3. That's a data lake path. Okay, so let's go to, okay, I guess it's going to start up its own job cluster. So that's good enough. Okay. So we're going to multitask because I'm running out of time and there's still a lot of stuff to talk about. <clears throat> so we finished talking about, just to recap, what a loader, what is it for you? You don't have to worry about running it now, right? You write that one thing, you say, hey, just stream it, and it just automatically appends or it can merge, okay? Um, so... We can also do a full load if we wanted to silver, but we just did to bit um, bronze. Try it's easy to set up. Uh, must code for each quality zone and can use parameterized notebooks. So that's what we did. We showed how to use JSON and auto load. It's running right now. Delta live tables. Okay, what is Delta live tables? It supports a bunch of things: files, event hubs, and databases. I haven't looked at event hubs and databases yet, but I've done files. It has two syntaxes: the SQL syntax and the Spark syntax. I'm going to show the SQL syntax. Um, you have to use the GUI to set it up, and it can be run as batch or streaming. It's built upon auto loading, okay? And it also supports materialized views that can actually do data integrity, which is kind of cool. Uh, easy to set up, built-in monitoring and logging. Uh, the big thing is you must get used to a new syntax. And the second thing is all the data, regardless of zones, has to reside in one database. So that is kind of like a stickler. So if you have something in which you want to have multiple tables, like we did, um, I'll admit this person, like we did before, then that can be problematic, right? So if we go to here, and look at our catalog in example one, we had a dim and fact table. If you went ahead and tried those two and you wanted to do that with all it wouldn't work, right? Because Autoloader wants to do this. So here's all our tables here for AdventureWorks, right? Um, Since we're running out of time, I'm not going to run the whole thing from scratch. But one of the things you can do is you can see right here that there is, these are all the bronze. I call them BZ for bronze and AG for dim products, right? I was working on, before you guys were coming online, a new um, piece of code because, you know, again, I do this in my free time. And so I didn't have everything done. Well, I wanted to, so let's just add this last one. So I'm going to create a gold later now. And BZ is for bronze, AG is for silver, and GZ is for gold. That way you can put it all in one database. And then what we're going to do is we're going to organize the data by region, year, and month. Okay. So this is this one right here. So this is organized by this guy. 
Okay, and this is going to create this delta live table. Then what I'm going to do is on this delta live table, and this is going to do a bunch of the BZs. It's also going to use the AG, and AG is basically a summarization of the products, and I'll show you what that does. Okay, and then what we want to do is we want to put that right here. So Control V, and now this is AdventureWorks, right? So this is AD Works. Dot. Okay, so let's take a look at what this does. Um, I'm going to show you the silver and then go back to the gold. So if we go back to the silver layer here. Okay. So remember I said you can do constraints. So we're going to create a table, okay, which is basically, it's a materialized table. It's based upon the streaming, okay. I didn't show you the syntax for the streaming, so I'll show you the syntax for streaming, even though we're not going to have to do it because the data is right there. Almost like the cloud files, but no, you do is you say create stream table. You can give it a comment. You can give it properties like, hey, the quality is equal to bronze on. I'm going to add star, but then I'm going to add the two things we were doing before, input file name and current timestamp. So this is my processing. Then I'm going to say cloud files, give it a path. that's going to load it automatically, give it a type. Then I'm going to give it some mapping, right? So one of my mapping is cloud files and for column types, okay? And what I did is I just repeated this all for all 16 tables or 17, right? So now I have them all loaded up that was going to be the first step second step is after that we're going to do the silver layer okay and the silver layer is a materialized view called dim products and i know this is going to be right because we're doing a full join but for, say i had a left join and i wanted to make sure that there was no data integrity we could say one of the constraint is don't process it if the product key is not null right so if there was no it would kick it out same thing with the subcategory so what i'm doing is i'm taking in the VentureWorks this three tables we have product some uh, product category and some category i'm basically just putting them together as one table so it's very simple silver zone and the last one i was working on i was showing you and i'm going to show you how to add it is the medallion was the gold zone so we're going to have a au data by region year and month okay so now we can and then i'm going to aggregate it i'm going to say au summarize data for reporting okay so now we're using the previous one right and data organized by region year and month summarized right so some so we got calendar year month region uh just want to make sure do, 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 do. I want to make sure a month was in here. Did I see month? Month num. I called it because it was not liking the word month. So let's call this month num. Let's report month and month num. And month num. Okay. So that's my latest fix to the Delta one. And let's now show you where you do it. So under workflows, if I didn't show you, is a Delta live table. Okay. And we can see this recent updates. It ran recently, so we can click on it just before you came on. And we can go to settings now. And what we can do is we can say, hey, guess what? I want to add an extra file. I want to make a gold zone. See, it's actually doing all the work that you used to have to do beforehand, but now you're just organizing it, right? So it's kind of really cool. I like this. So we go to Delta Live Tables, and then what we're going to do is going to add the gold layer. So the gold layer is there. Select it. And we're going to save it. Okay, success. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start it. And hopefully there's no bugs there. And what it's going to do is going to create the update. It's going to wait for resources. It's going to run the graphs. It's going to run everything. So while this uh, says fail to resolve flow AG data, so maybe there's a bug in this. Ch -ch -ch. Cannot be found. Verify the spelling. Okay, so maybe let's go back to it. Never tried having one based upon the other in the same notebook, so maybe I have to break it out. That might be a limitation. We'll find out in a minute. Always the fun of trying to do a live demo. So let's go back to here. So we're saying create or refresh live AU table. So this is the goal later, right? This guy. Did I change that from here? Eventworks. It doesn't like it though. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clone this. And if we get one working, then that's the problem. It's it you can't do two in the same 
thing. So I'm going to create a clone. Right, hit clone. So it's just copy of the workspace. Right. Going to go back to the delta, and we're going to load this guy. Load table two. Just going to get rid of it because we can always create a view or just run that query anyway. So okay. So now let's go back to workflows, delta tables. Click it, and then start. Okay, while that's running, let's go to the other demo that I had baking in the background, right? On the catalog, uh, did it not work? Of course not. Or red. Red, why did it fall? Okay, problem. It's trying to do all these, but I have a limited number of resources and what's doing, it's saying that I am out of resources. So that is always something that can happen. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop this guy. Hopefully it didn't blow up the other one too. So this is my own private one and there's a quota on course. So always something to pay attention to and let's look. So I created it. Let's see, workspace, catalog. Uh, okay, so that's a catch 22. I can't see it, but it's there. So let's just get this one done. So we're going to go workflows, and we want to do it auto loader, and we're going to run this guy. Okay, let's go to Delta Live tables, talk about them a little more. I'm running out of time, and then we can. Try to close this up. Okay. So Delta Live Tables. This is from a uh, Lakashu Bala Submarinium. I probably butchered his name, but he's on medium.com. And this is what he said. Take it for a grain of salt. I haven't done a lot with Delta Tables, but here's the thing. Pros, guarantees transactions enhances query performance you know and so on the delta live tables though real-time capabilities low latency high availability flexible scaling delta tables requires current you know optimization slow updates for large tables right um he doesn't like it because he thinks it's complex octa structure um real time may require extra expertise in processing frameworks i don't know i kind of like it because you just define it at a higher level you don't have to worry about all things you say hey, create table as long as the files drop in the directories that you're looking for everything works okay um so data quality we talked about the expect and fail uh expressions right um label Label data is valid or invalid, right? Um, we can see that, you know, this one, there's two syntaxes. We got the create live table here and student cloud files, and then we're creating live table from live table raw. So it's picking it up again. But also we can have the DLT, which is a decorator in Python, which is another syntax, right? It also supports change data captured, right? So you can do overwrite or effective dating. So there's some really cool features, advanced features, like you said on that. Delta clones, let's talk about clones. There's two types, a shallow clone, okay, and a deep clone. This is the last topic we're gonna to talk about tonight, what's new. So a shallow clone copies over the metadata, but doesn't copy over the original source files. Deep clone copies over metadata and source files. You can optionally keep files in sync in DR, okay, so D clones are really good for saying, hey, guess what? I want to make a copy for like, you know, um, production down to QA, and it will create a clone for you. Okay, let's go back to the demos and let's see if these finish. So this one's running, and wow, it looked like it ran. Is it all done? Nope, it's still running. So we got a few more. We can see that the auto loader, the auto loader takes a little longer because it's doing streaming. And so it's going to stop the stream and then it's going to stop the stream. Okay. So I do see it takes a little longer, but at the same time as say, if you don't want to load multiple files, like the problem with loading in the past is if I said, Hey, by the way, 
load from this particular directory all CSV files, it's going to load them all into your delta, I meant your branch, right? And if from branch to silver, you'd have to do an upsert. And so maybe you'd read files more than once unless you move them, right? This one's smart enough, it leaves the files there, but no, it does is it uses checkpoints. And by using checkpoints, it only picks up the files that are new, which is kind of cool, right? So that's one feature I do like about auto loading. It's still running, so let's see. So it finished this guy, right? And now this guy says blocked. We can go into this one. So this one, is it taking three minutes? Can't be taking a cold three minutes. See, stream initialized. So it found, this one's for, uh, it looks like products, right? And then it streams initializing, so it's still running it. So if we go to jobs, go back to autoloader. Unfortunately, we have to wait to this finish so I can get some compute. So now it skipped this one, or it's starting this one, starting this one. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six more. Six more to do. It's been running. So this took four minutes, two minutes right here, but it failed. And unfortunately, we don't have a last real run, so maybe two more minutes. Let's bring up at least the code and go over it. So when we do get a cluster, we can just finish up the last example. So under workspace, under shared, under what's new, under Delta clones, let's bring up the cloning technology and take a look. So we can create a database called clones, right? And what we can do is we can do a point in time copy. That's just a, if you don't say shallow clone, just say clone, it's gonna create a deep clone. So we can say create or replace Delta, and we're gonna look V4 clones, tables, deep clone. We're gonna clone of the VentureWorks, which is the load, which is being loaded by um, the Delta live tables, the bronze zone dim, okay? We can also do a file copy, a pointer, create, replace table, shallow clone, okay? And uh, this one says, create, place auto, on a venture work so we can you know get rid of auto file and make it as a deep clone from the venture works and that could be kind of like cloning from one environment to another if you had you know um, them pointing to say like a catalog you could do that right and we can say hey show where the key is show the key and then what we can do is you can update a new sheriff in town now this one was that um, and when we did this, it was a deep clone. So when we do AdventureWorks and then we do auto and then we change AdventureWorks, guess what? It's not actually going to change the other one, okay? And that's about it. So that's the main difference. Let's see if the last demo finished and then we can wrap up. So if we go to auto load files and we're down to one more. And this one is the. Is it running it right now? Hopefully it is. Okay, it looks like it's done. So if we go to jobs, number five, and hopefully it's all green, it's all green. And then if we go to workspace, I meant catalog. Uh, now the problem is to use a catalog, we have to uh, have a cluster. And guess what? We don't have a cluster. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop my cluster again. I'll do a single node. Uh, yes. Just go on up, please. I have to make sure I add a few more uh, computing to my audit size. Okay. Why is it doing that? Okay, let's go back to recents, come on. And then we want to go this guy. Okay, I'm going to wrap up. So let's talk about the summary and then we'll go back and we'll take one look, more look at the auto and then I'll answer questions. So the Databricks product has matured over the years, okay? In the past, we've used to create parameterized notebooks to transform our files in a lake. Today, we have two new choices. Autoloader, 
just for files, not for anything else. Delta Live files will work with RDMS databases as well as hubs, event hubs, okay? Auto load pattern allows for a quick ingestion of files, okay? Can use batch or streaming. Um, gives the developer fine-grained control over the code, right? And Delta Live files, okay, has abstracted many details away from the developer. You don't care. You just tell it where the directory is, and you can start using, um, you know, those constraints to actually check up on your data. If you use the SQL, then it's pretty quick, easy. Uh, finally, Delta cloning is a good point for point-in-time copies of data you, or placing read-only copy of the data in a low environment. And basically, you just have to keep up with it, right? So future is bright for engineers that keep on changing with the adapting environment. There's a bunch of reference here about the Databricks company. Like I said, Data Lake was the biggest thing that happened within the last five years. Delta Lake, Spark Pipelines, Databricks Workflows, Autoload or Delta Live Tables. The thing about the medium, I don't know about that. I have to sp spend more time with Delta Live Tables to tell you that clones and cloning for DR. This is a really good one. This is by Danny Lee. He used to work at Microsoft. I know him when I was MVP, and now he works for Databricks. Okay, and that's about it. So I'm gonna open up to questions. Stevie, still there? Yep. Great session. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, John. Let's wait a few minutes for questions. Sure. I know it's a lot. And again, to recap, you know. What did we talk about today, Dre? And I'll go back to because I know some people joined later. Uh, we talked about data engineering core concepts, right? Spark.read, that Spark.road. And we talked about how before workflows were there, right? We basically had to go ahead and worry about, you know, calling one notebook from another. Now we have workflows. We have precedent constraints. We can say, hey, something failed, send me an email. Something succeeded, send me an email. Something didn't complete in 15 minutes, send me an email, try right? auto loader. Guess what, now we don't have to look for a particular file in the directory, if it keeps track of checkpoints, and as long as you dump files into the raw directory, it picks them up, right? Delta Live Tables is better than auto load because not only works with files, but also works with RDMMS, such relational databases, and it also works with event hubs and cloning. It's just a technology allows you to make copy of those Delta Tables, and those Delta Tables we talked about are just basically parquet files with log files. Thank you, John. That's great. Thank you so much. That was great. Really appreciate it. No and problem. One Thank more you. time, Have a great this night. session is recorded and will be published on YouTube and Rubble once it's published. Thank you, everyone, for joining our online meeting today. With that, thank you. Have a great day and see you here on next meeting. Thank you. Thank you and have a nice night. Bye. Thanks. Good night. Bye bye.